What's up, Wizards? It's that man again from SBMTG. Uh, magic life, I guess. I don't know what this is that I'm doing. Anyway, you know what can suck is when you're trying to do the magic cards. Uh, when you're trying to play some magical cards and you play against a, a deck and you're like, oh, that's a cool deck. It's kind of neat what that does. It seems really powerful. And then you play against that deck again. Uh, and you play another game and you play, pff, lo and behold, that deck. It's that deck again. Uh, and then you play another game and it's a different deck. So that's cool. But then the next game you play, it's that that same deck you just played against again. But then you play another game and it goes back to the first deck. And this happens uh, for eight hours. Or maybe, like, you're trying to do, like, an F&M or something, you know? Back in the long, long ago, we did those. And, like, two people at your shop just play the same deck every week. And it's, like, a thing that they got on the internet because it's the best deck in the format. And you, gotta, you know you're going to have to play against it every week. And you just have, like... 30 bucks <laughs> to build decks or whatever. Um, and so you know that you're not going to get through them. Good luck winning packs that week at FNM. Uh, and that is also um, sucky. It's bad. And then maybe someday, not far from that moment in time, you hear someone utter the word net decking and you think to yourself, yeah, yeah, that's the problem with the game right now. And that leads you down a rabbit hole of radical reactionary content. And before you know it, you're calling people net deckers. And it sounds really unhinged when you say it. So don't be that guy. You don't have to go that far. Instead, just watch this video. Because if you're mad about people playing decks they found on the internet, maybe the best way to do it is to fight fire with fire and play some, some decks you found on the internet. Weird premise, I know. But stick with me, because if you care about the meta at all, whether it's because you play meta decks or because you want to beat meta decks, this will be a decent little video for you because today we're going to go through eight rogue deck lists. Again, not, I've said this before, but not tribal rogues decks with cards that have the creature type rogue. We're talking about like home brews, off meta decks that have seen a little bit of success in the current meta right now, but are nonetheless not, uh, they're not going to win any popularity contests, but that just means that they're dark horse contenders that are flying under the radar right now, no one's game planning for them, and a lot of people have never heard of them, so maybe they're exactly the decks you need to slip through the meta right now. Now, as usual, a lot of work went into this bad boy. I joke, but I do, um, work. I research things. It takes time and energy. But anyway, um, again, a lot, a lot of work went into this one. So if you have the time, sir or madam, like and subscribe to the channel there. Uh, sorry for the, that was a really annoying accent. Uh, like and subscribe. Do that stuff. Let's talk about decks. Now, our first deck of the day, number eight, is kind of an honorable mention in a way, sort of a nod to all my, my budget homies that actually got me here in the first place. I wouldn't have this stinking YouTube play button if it, were, if it weren't for the budget content, so I gotta, I gotta give one for the budget boys, and that's Mono Blue Mill. Now, there's a catch to this bad boy right here, and that is that it's actually an artisan deck, but this deck has won two straight artisan events at Hello Good Games. Now, the version of the deck that we're going to talk about today was piloted by one Mr. Tom Nolan to a 5-0 finish at an HGG Artisan event. Now, every deck we're going to talk about today is available in the links in the doobly-doo down there. Just hit show more in the description, and all them deck list links will open up to you. It's a wealth of information and knowledge down there. So if you want to see this entire deck list, check it out. But with this deck and the other decks today, we're going to be looking mostly at key cards and key points in their strategy. And this deck really shouldn't surprise you. It's all the cards you would expect. The only problem is that it's restricted to commons and uncommons. But honestly, this deck performs really admirably in the artisan meta, where there's a bunch of really good decks like Is It Tempo and whatnot. Fantastic deck. Mono White Aggro, fantastic deck. But this deck just peels through a field full of aggro decks, which should really tell you something considering it's a mono blue mill deck with relatively little defense. There's also plenty of ways to spruce it up. You can add Maddening Cacophony once you actually unlock the ability to put rares in the deck. <laughs> you can add Maddening Cacophony or Castle Vantress, a bunch of other stuff. Brazen Borrower would go somewhat well in this deck as a piece of tempo. So there's a lot you can do with the deck, but just the base artisan form of it can actually do some real work. And it's only like five bucks to build the thing right now. But in terms of key cards, again, things you would expect. Stuff like Ruin Crab and Teferi's Tutelage to do the majority of our milling for us. And then we use stuff like End the Story and Thirst for Meaning to draw cards to make sure we can proc Teferi's Tutelage about a billion times and draw into more Ruin Crabs and lands to proc them. Now, pretty much every card in the deck not named Ruin Crab draws cards. I was going to say not named Ruin Crab or Teferi's Tutelage, then I realized Tutelage does in fact draw cards. So almost everything in this deck 
picks up more cards from the top of the deck so you can churn through proc tutelage and keep doing more cool stuff but there are a couple of really spicy pieces in the deck that aren't just opter frantic inventory or whatever and they are low mages domination and mystic sanctuary the deck makes really good use of mystic sanctuary because you can always say have a tutelage out for instance and then Play Mystic Sanctuary a little bit later in the game to get it into the story to put back on top of your library. At that point, you can just opt or frantic inventory or omen of the sea or whatever it takes to draw that card off the top and then cast it into the story again. And suddenly you've just gotten like literally 20 mils <laughs> off of Teferi's tutelage all in the same turn. This deck can put together some ridiculous mill turns, especially if it gets multiple copies of Teferi's tutelage out. And sometimes your opponent can go from 30 cards, literally half their deck, to zero in one turn really quickly. Now for number seven, we're going to talk about a, kind of a blast from the past that never really went away. It hung on through rotation. It hung on through losing some key cards. It hung on through the, the Cauldron Familiar ban. <laughs> Maybe that's why I like it. I identify with it. I also hung on through all of those things. Kept on keeping on. But anyway, number seven is Jund Midrange, a.k.a. Jund Food. And honestly... For my money and a lot of other people's money, I think the mono green food deck is probably altogether better than this deck. But at the same time, at the same time, if you can get the mana to work for you, this deck definitely gets to play some extremely strong cards. Now, the version we're going to talk about today was played in the Japanese tournament to a 3-3 finish by Takahiro Yamamoto. And it plays stuff that you would expect, like Feasting Troll King, <laughs> King, King, Trail of Crumbs, The Great Hinge, Wicked Wolf, I mean, all these food-generating cards, and of obviously the card advantage-generating engine of The Great Hinge. Just about any deck with green in it in this format is going to play that card. But it's got some stuff you might not expect and haven't seen in a minute, like Korvald, one of the main reasons that this deck factors in red and black mana at all is to play core vault and uh you can see why you're still sacrificing a bunch of food you're still playing witch's oven in the deck some of these decks play a copy of weaponize the monsters or two to make sure they have another sacrifice outlet and obviously core vault is crazy in that situation because it's yet another card advantage engine it's a big flying creature that you know gets big enough to shut games out by itself so it's another threat like feasting troll king that can threaten to just end games on its own but in the meantime it's getting you all kinds of card advantage which is really sweet in a deck that doesn't play the edge wall innkeeper route. Instead, we're going to play Great Hinge late, we're going to play Corvold late, we're going to get all our card advantage in the latter half of the game. The deck also gets to slot in Claim the Firstborn and the Acroan War, which are both really good pickups. Often you'll see Acroan War in the sideboard, Claim the Firstborn in the main deck of a lot of these lists. And it's just like playing the good old Red Black Sack decks from back in the day, where you can just nab one of their creatures with Claim and immediately sack it to Witches Oven, and that still feels really good and will cause tilts and scoops and whatnot, but in the late game you've got ridiculous card advantage engines, you've got huge threats, recursive threats in the form of Feasting Troll King, a lot of life gain to keep you in the game against, you know, small ball aggro decks and whatnot. And then you've got massive tricks like Kazul's Fury. You get that core vault big enough and you can just fling it at your opponent and kill them for the last few you know, points of damage. Same thing with Feasting Troll King. You can just throw a Feasting Troll King at their head for at least seven damage. If you played it with a Great Hinge in play, it's suddenly eight damage, and that'll end the game on the spot a lot of the time. So Kazul's Fury is another one of those red cards the deck gets to slot in. It's really nice to have access to. Village Rights is another reason to add black to the deck, and the old Jun Sacrifice decks didn't even have Village Rights. And number six is a deck that you already knew existed, but maybe you didn't know that you could play successfully right now. So you might get really excited when I tell you that Mono Black Devotion is a real deck at the moment. It's actually been getting results here and there throughout the entire season. But recently, it was played at the Latin American Challenge by Luis Provitina to a 3-1 and one finish, which isn't super impressive. Decks can go 3-1 and one and not be amazing or anything, but at least it's a winning record at a relatively large tournament. I shouldn't have to tell you some of the key cards to this. We play Gary and Ayara because they've been best friends for like a year now, ever since Eldraine came out. I ship them and I have for a minute at this point, but obviously I shouldn't have to tell you to play both of these cards. They go together like peanut butter and ladies, but we also play things like Archfiend's Vessel, Call of the Death Dweller, which can not only get back the Archfiend's Vessel, get you a 5-5, but sometimes it'll get back the Ayara for you, and Ayara is a creature with a huge target on her back, so if she doesn't get Scorching Dragonfire, or Elspeth Conquers Death, or what, if she doesn't get exiled, then it's really nice to have something like Call to get her back, so that you not only have three Devotion Pips, but you just have more damage coming through. You know, the drains from Ayara are something that we, we don't really take into account enough. This is actually a very powerful card just on its own, but... 
Obviously, combined with Gary, you can do some really gross stuff, but again, add to that the power of cards like Archfiend's Vessel and Call of the Death Dweller, and Hagadim's Awakening and whatnot, and it turns out Mono Black is kind of better than it's ever been. It's just quietly doing well right now. And it even got to pick up some spicy cards here in the spice slots, I guess we're calling it that now. This deck actually plays four copies of Marauding Blight Priest. <laughs> it's insanity. Like, I guess so it doesn't have to play four copies of Veto because it's legendary. The deck does work in two copies of Veto, just so you know. But it also plays all four Blight Priests, which is really dope. And I like that there's a deck that actually plays this card right now. But there's also a co a four whole copies of Null Priest of Oblivion in the deck. Again, for bringing back those Archfiend's Vessels, those Ayaras, and especially those Gary when you've been able to stalemate the game and just kind of build a board presence, suddenly Null Priest looks incredible. And as a matter of fact, there's a sweet line where a lot of times you play Gary, your opponent kills your Gary with a Heartless Act or whatever. Blood Chief's Thirst, it really doesn't matter. But then next turn, all you gotta do is play a land, kick Null Priest, and you get your Gary again. It actually gets to deal more damage than it did last time, thanks to Null Priest. So that's a really sweet line. And this deck actually has a plethora of really sweet lines right now. And again, Mono Black, just like the last deck we talked about, might be better than it's ever been right now. And just people aren't paying enough attention to it. And number five is another deck that you know existed. And you were probably pretty excited about when you first realized it could be a deck. But it's done nothing since then. <laughs> That's Orzhov Humans. Yet another deck that was like super popular on the Patreon poll when the cards first came out. Everyone wanted to see the General Kudro deck, but it didn't uh, do great. I think we could all agree with that. But lately, it's been getting some results, but the best result so far has been at the Gentry Weekly by one Mr. Alexander Silnachenko, who played it to a 3-1 finish. Again, 3-1's not the absolute best record in the world, but at least it's a winning record. And again, not the biggest tournament ever, but at least a somewhat sizable tournament with a lot of, some sort of a lot of entrance. <laughs> this deck plays some of the things you would probably expect it to play, like the aforementioned General Kudro, but surprise, the deck only plays one copy of this card because apparently it has better things to do. We also have other humans payoffs like Dire Tactics, still a really good removal piece for the humans decks, but again, we're not so much a General Kudro deck as we are a Bastion of Remembrance deck. Really, we're kind of aristocrats in philosophy. We even play four copies of Lamb Pad of Death's Vigil, which I'll put here in the key card category rather than the spicy card category because it's very integral to what the deck is attempting to do. You know, activated abilities from Lamb Pad and triggers from Bastion can add to each other and stack up really, really fast, especially in a deck like this that puts a lot of creatures on the battlefield relatively quickly. But easily the spiciest card, not only in this deck, but like, pretty much in any deck that we'll talk about today, is Night Squad Commando. That's the art that's that I'm using for this portion of the video. I bet a lot of you are like, what art is this, Dev? It turns out it's Night Squad Commando, a card that is actually kind of sweet. A little bit expensive, I will say that much, and I think most people just think of this card as a draft card, but we play a ton of one and two drops in this deck. It's very easy to attack on turn three and get two bodies out of this card, and again, that is what this deck wants. The absolute most is to fill the board with as many bodies as possible, so a card like this ain't actually half bad in a deck that really just wants to generate as many small creatures as it can as quickly as possible, just so that it can off them all at the same time, so a card like Night Squad Commando actually has a really good home in a deck like this and even though there are some odd choices in the deck and maybe it looks like the player didn't necessarily have all the cards they needed to put together the deck they wanted on paper it can look that way but maybe they're actually just the smartest person in the room and it turns out cards like commando are incredible right now and they're worth playing just one copy of kudro but here we are halfway point of this here video i hope you're enjoying it make sure you like and subscribe i'm gonna Apparently I'm supposed to say it a bunch of times in a video. Seems counterintuitive to me, like that would annoy you and make you not do the thing. But I'm just, that's what people are telling me. But anyway, uh, do it. <laughs> Number four is Simic Tempo. This is actually a ramp deck, but it's a really, really interesting ramp deck. Now, in terms of key cards and stuff here, again, you probably expect it. We're playing Ugin the Spirit Dragon. This is an Ugin deck. There's a few of those in standard right now. They get a little annoying, but if you want to play an Ugin deck that pretty much no one is playing, try this one out because we've also get to play stuff like Gadwick in the deck, and Gadwick is kind of just Hydroid Krasis 
Nowadays, it's Hydroid Crisis that also kind of functions as a removal piece because you can tap down your opponent's stuff. Just a silly card, and Gavik is actually a lot better than it gets any credit for. It's really good in these like mono blue control and mono blue um, Lotus, uh, Nyx Lotus decks and whatnot, the combo deck. But honestly, I think that Gavik is a much better card than even those fringe decks would denote that it is. And people need to wake up to how good Gavik is. And obviously, this player knows how good they are. By the way, this was played in a Japanese tournament by a player named Akachan to a 4-0 finish. So the results are getting a little bit better. Maybe you're starting to see why I tiered the decks in the way that I did. But anyway, this isn't just an Ugin and Gadwick deck. This deck also plays Cultivate. Obviously, I just had to put this in the key card slot, as well as Neutralize. Now, the reason I'm putting these two cards on the key cards slide is because I think that they best sort of, you know, tell the story of this deck's philosophy. When you when it's safe to <laughs> against certain opponents, you're just going to play these cultivates. You're going to play migration paths and all other kind of rampy cards. But against other opponents who you don't want to resolve key spells on key turns, you've got stuff like neutralize, mystical dispute, essence scatter. So this is kind of a ramp slash control deck and it's just not the kind of ramp deck that you see every day. The reason this is called Simic Tempo is because the early turns are mostly controlled by counter spells and bounce spells. You know, we've got stuff like into the royal in this deck of all things, but it's actually a spicy pick for a ramp deck because early in the game it can be your turn two tempo piece. Later in the game if you draw it, it can just draw you a card. You got the mana laying around to do it so I like that idea, but we also play stuff like Stern Dismissal, just so you know how serious this deck is is about bouncing creatures. <laughs> it actually plays all four copies of Stern Dismissal. This is actually a better card than it gets credit for, too. Whenever somebody plays it against me on Arena, I'm always more than mildly annoyed. So <laughs> keep, take heed of the power of Stern Dismissal. But we also get to play stuff like Kiora Best the Sea God, which, aside from Ugin, is maybe the second best ramp sp like target in the entire format right now. This deck has a lot of juice and really uses its turns in interesting ways. You know, turn one, we got Stern Dismissal missile online against aggro. Turn two, we got things like Into the Royal and Brazen Bar online against aggro. Turn three, we can either neutralize their big spell or we can cultivate. And by turn four, Migration Path, hopefully we haven't died to life loss because we were able to actually tempo them out of the game a little bit. And then we can play Ugin and all is well. It's just a really interesting design philosophy. Usually you see these ramp decks with no bottom end whatsoever, but this deck actually takes the bottom end into consideration a lot. And I think really does some interesting things with with it. Now, number three is where we're going to start getting into some real, actual results. I believe all of the rest of, yeah, all the rest of the results for decks in this video are from Channel Fireball Clash Qualifiers, which are real tournaments that you have to win a whole bunch of games to actually do well in. For instance, number three is Is It Control, piloted a CFB Clash Qualifier by user JPSN54 to an 8 and 1 record. That's right, in a really hostile meta full of decks that we are, are known qualities. Uh, this deck actually managed eight wins and just one loss. There's got to be something there. Now, as far as key cards go, one of our only actual win conditions in this deck is Shark Typhoon. That's the big one. Usually, you want to either you want to resolve it, but often you'll just cycle it and get like a six six in the late game and start smashing your opponent's head in. You know, protect your six six with counter spells and just win the game like that. So often, Shark Typhoon is the only win condition in the deck actually needs and it achieves getting that late into the game by just playing stuff like neutralize you know this is yet another four neutralized deck turns out neutralize ain't a bad card in this format at all especially when you're on the play but we also play fire prophecy storm's wrath just all the stuff that you would expect a blue red deck to play but i guess it's actually worth playing <laughs> nowadays especially when you have stuff like shark typhoon to win the game but don't worry there actually is some real spice in this deck it wouldn't be on the list if there weren't some actual spice. So we also, this this is where things take a turn. We play Zerda, the Dawn Waker, as our companion. Pretty insane, right? It turns out cycling is an activated ability. So Shark Typhoon has cycling, and not too many other permanents even exist <laughs> in the deck, except for Midnight Clock, which also has an activated ability, meaning that it's safe to play if Zerd is your companion. But this is also really good against the various and sundry mill decks in the format, whether it's Rogue or just straight up Teferi's Tutelage Ruin Crab 
garbage <laughs> you know this is really good against all those mill decks and the refill is very real when midnight clock does go off it's actually it kind of feels like one of the best cards in the format and in the meantime it's ramp to get to all the stuff you want to ramp to like shark typhoon for instance number two is naya aggro played at a cfb clash qualifier by noah whalert i hope i got that name right to a nine zero finish perfecto my friends with naya aggro a deck you probably didn't know existed, but oh wait, you did. Because this is actually the premier Winota deck in the format right now. A lot of people tried Mardu Winota, even just Boros Winota, Winota. But it turns out that what you just want to be doing is playing the Gruul Adventures deck with Edgewall Innkeeper and whatnot, Lovestruck Beast and all that stuff. And you just throw white mana in the deck so you can play Winota. The deck also plays Basri's Lieutenant as a really sweet hit off of Winota. And there are some awkward things about the deck, like Edgewall Innkeeper's a human, <laughs> right? So playing that on turn one doesn't really help out your Winota too much. But playing Lovestruck Beast certainly does <laughs> in this instance. Plus the deck obviously plays Bone Crusher Giant and a bunch of other non-human creatures. So by the time you actually do get to turn four, Winota is a sweet draw. Plus you can engineer stuff, you know, like... One turn, maybe you play all the creatures you have in exile from playing them as adventures. And then the next turn, that's when you play your... That's when you drop that Winota Sun and you just start going to town once it's actually safe to do so. In the meantime, you're just playing the old Edgewall Innkeeper 1-2 deck. And that's a proven to be a sweet deck in the past. But again, you get really cool picks like Lovestruck... Like um, Bazaru's Lieutenant, rather. And some spicy stuff, too. There is some stuff this deck does that I really like. It plays a Silver Bullet Kenrith the Return King, which is obviously dumb to get off of a Winota trigger, but even if you just draw it naturally, it's a fine card to draw because it does a lot of cool stuff, especially in long or grindy stalemate games, which there's a lot of in the format right now. I think Kenrith's another one of those cards we need to re-examine because it might be pretty sweet at the moment. But another one of my favorite, like, kind of janky, not great looking card inclusions that I nonetheless think is really good spice in this deck is Fairy Guide Mother. Now this is a one drop that's not a human, so it can swing for Winota. It can also swing somewhat safely because of the evasion. You don't have to worry about it dying just so you get a trigger from Winota. So there's that. Um, but this is all, you can also do the old, you know, fairy guide mother lovestruck beast trick where you just get like a seven power flying lovestruck beast through on your opponent for a whole lot of damage out of nowhere all at one time. You know, the old Selesny Adventures decks really closed a lot of games with that trick alone. And this deck has access to that and Bone Crusher and Winota and Edgewall and Embercleave. Just like, it's a really, really cool take on the Winota deck that just slams together two already existing decks to amazing results. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that Fairy Godmother is also awesome with Edgewall Innkeeper because, you know, one mana draw a card is typically good. But anyway, final deck of the video, everybody. We finally made it. Are you ready? You settled in? You want to know what it is? Because it is super, super spicy. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the sauce. Um, I bet you didn't, you definitely didn't know this one was a thing. Well, I can't say that because, because I think that some people do know this deck is a thing, but I think other people are going to be super surprised. Number one <laughs> is Mono White Control. Of all things, <laughs> this deck kind of evolved too from Mono White Yorion into just a straight Mono White Control deck that doesn't even play Yorion anymore. And it turns out this deck is actually really, really good. This was played again at a CFB Clash qualifier by Michael Rooks to again a 9 and 0 finish. You know, the reason this is number one in the Naya Aggro deck was number two is because, like, we know Winota's a good card. We know the Edgewall Innkeeper, the Adventures deck is a good deck. So if you slam those two things together and get a 9 0, I'm not actually super surprised by that. Mono white control <laughs> getting a 9-0 is actually like in that's that's big news, I would imagine. So what what, what does this deck do? Uh it's a it's a Nugan deck. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna be straight with you. I'm just be upfront with you uh, right off the get-go here. This is a Nugan deck, but it approaches getting Ugin in really interesting ways, and it does things on its way to Ugin that other decks don't have access to. We can do some really interesting stuff. We've got Legion Angel as a one of in this deck, three of them in the sideboard. So it's just another dimension to the deck, a threat we can use to close games out with flying and just kind of get over like one for one removal. Legion Agent's really, really, really good against that. But we've also got a Miria's Call, which is yet another win condition. You know, once we've got the game well in hand and the board state is under control, a Miria's Call is just like, you know, capable of finishing the game and 
three turns pretty easily and often it doesn't even take that long because two four four flyers is a business son so i'd really like the myriad's call as a win condition the plays the deck plays the full play set of them but we've also got stuff like maze mind tome and i bring this up in the you know critical cards the key cards portion of this part of the video uh, just because maze mind tome is actually easily like one of the secrets to the stack for the longest time mono white has been pretty bad. Just white as a color in the color pie has been fairly bad because it just doesn't have a way to get real card advantage. And they've experimented with stuff like Mangara lately and Dawn of Hope and whatnot to get white some card advantage. But even those cards have been somewhat mediocre, especially outside of the commander format. But it turns out that Maze Mind Tome is exactly the answer that these mono white decks needed. You catch mono green decks and mono red decks. You know, the, the Rakdos ramp deck plays Maze Mind Tome right now. We catch so many decks playing Maze Mind Tome because it gives these colors that don't have the opportunity to get card advantage the opportunity to get card advantage, which just changes the whole game entirely. So if Maze Mind Tome didn't exist, I'm not actually sure this deck would exist. Now in the spice slot, we've got stuff like Skyclave Relic. Pretty interesting play. The deck only plays two copies of this, and to be quite honest, I've played a lot of games now. I've played more games with this deck than any other deck in this video. I'll be upfront with you. And Skyclave Relic could probably get cut. If I'm being honest with you, we'd probably find something better to do than Relic, but I have enjoyed it some of the time. It helps you get the Ugin really fast. You know, if you have six mana, suddenly you have Ugin on the next turn. So it is important in that function. And often this deck needs lots of mana to do lots of stuff. We've got Crawling Barons, Castle Ardenvale, and about a hundred other ways to use mana on our turn to make sure it's not wasted, which is another secret to the deck. So, you know, sometimes you'll need a card like this, you know, these, these multiple rocks, uh, just to make sure you have enough mana to do all the things you want to do in a turn. Sometimes you want to cast a Myria's Call and something else. <laughs> and obviously that costs a bunch of mana, so it can be really nice to have these rocks. And Swift Response, my friends, actually a really, really dope removal piece here. The deck only plays two copies of it, but honestly, <laughs> I'm thinking, especially in the best of one environment, where you're a little bit more likely to run up against creatures. I am seriously thinking about upping this to at least three copies. Swift Response is such a good spell, man. Especially against... You know, us, we don't really play too many creatures in this deck whatsoever. So in the early game, we catch people swinging in with all kinds of stuff we haven't, we sh they shouldn't swing in with, and catch it and, and hit it with swift response, right? You know, just today, I've caught two Edgewall Innkeepers and a Scoot Swarm with swift response because our opponent thought it was completely safe to swing in, but swift response destroy target tap creature it turns out it's just really good there's fewer questing beasts in the format nowadays even though there are still some questing beasts and other creatures with vigilance but for the most part swift response is just a removal spell against nine out of ten creatures in the environment at instant speed for only two mana and i have really liked this card as a removal spell so far i mean you can 5-0 you can 6-0 you can even 7-0 on like the arena events some of the time and it can be sort of a fluke your opponent got bad draws you got amazing draws your opponent got mana screwed, whatever you know some of these things can be a fluke you legitimately won three games but the other four were just all random chance but a 9-0 is really really difficult to fake even the one time you know so just try this and every other deck on the list out because all of these i've kind of taken spins with myself and a lot of them are a lot of fun even the stuff that looks boring like is a control can really kind of knock you out with how effective it can be even in a meta with some really powerful decks right now you know decks like gruel and rogues and all the various yorion builds are all killer decks at the moment but most of these decks can actually hold their own against them fairly well, and I would imagine with some of these decks, you have a lot of these cards in your collection, whether in real life or on Arena right now. So if this video succeeded in giving you any ideas whatsoever, or maybe you got a new pet deck from this thing, then uh, like and subscribe. I did it. I brought it around. Third time's a charm. You'll do it this time, I know. But anyway, that's it for my top eight off meta decks. And there were some other things I could talk about. You know, obviously Mardu Yorion is a deck that people are playing right now, but I felt like too many people were playing Mardu Yorion for it to be an, an off meta deck at this point. If you have any other meta decks that I, or off meta decks that I didn't talk about in this video, feel free to tell me about them in the comments section down there. If you just enjoyed the video, again, feel free to tell me about it in the comments section. Help me out with the algorithm by doing that stuff. Also, if you want to, you can watch me play Magic on Twitch at twitch.tv slash sbmtgdev. And if you want to help determine what we do around here, what the content is in the first place, then head on over to the link in the description and go to patreon.com slash sbmtg. Just donate a dollar a month, and uh, you'll not only help the channel tremendously, I can like, pay my rent and stuff and like eat.
Uh, I could probably survive without a couple of meals, but I got to eat eventually. So help me uh, live my life by just donating a dollar a month. And again, that'll help you vote on what we do here on the channel and on Twitch sometimes too. So all the power in the world to affect YouTube history, one dollar a month. I think I'm worth it. <laughs> I guess I'm done for this one. That's all I got for now. Um, so I will catch you cuts later. I'm Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.